And now, without further ado, please welcome again the stars of 2001 A Space Odyssey, Keir DeLay and Gary Lockwood. <laughs> Keir, you were just saying that this, this time it, it got to you. It really did. I, I think I have to uh, second guess myself. This is the greatest film that Stan <laughs> could ever made. <laughs> you know, uh, I've always doubted you when you said that. <laughs> I, 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 it's worth reminding the audience that um, not one foot of this film was made with computer-generated special effects. Everything you see in this film or saw in this film was done physically or chemically, one way or the other. Chemically, meaning we were on LSD? <laughs> <laughs> A guy once said to me, he saw 2001, and he said, man, that was so cool, I can't believe it. Were you guys on LSD, man? <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, well, before and after, but not during. <laughs> Actually, it's worth mentioning that um, you, it, 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 within a few months, MGM uh, realized that a lot of young people were attending the film having smoked funny cigarettes. So um, they changed their advertising posters and the new posters said, 2001. The ultimate trip. <laughs> so raise your hands uh, for questions. Oh, and we'll, what, one nope. other thing. Yes, one other yes. thing. You might be interested to know that most of the actors who played the various male characters on the space station in the meeting, uh, on the vehicle that's going on the surface of the moon to uh, where the monolith is, 90%, I'm not, I don't remember if it's true for Floyd, but all of them were Canadian. Um, including the voice of Hal, Doug Rain, which probably many of you know, but all of them were Canadian. Why? Well, a lot of Canadian actors settled over there in those days because at that time, you didn't need a work permit. <laughs> if you were Canadian, you could work in England as if it was your home base. A Canadian connection to a classic. I we hope have... your food's better than the English food. <laughs> <laughs> we have our first question over here, sir. Hi, Kier. Uh, one, a couple of... Well, a two-part question. How did you become involved in the sequel film? And secondly, what was your reaction to it? It was... You want... All right. I'll start by saying it was... It was, it was a good film. Um, not 2001. We didn't have Stanley Kubrick. Um, how did I get involved with it? I was on the West Coast doing an uh, guest starring on some episodic television. I don't remember what it was. And... Um, I happened to get a copy of The Hollywood Reporter and saw that they were doing a sequel. I had read, I think I had read by that time, the book, 2010, um, by, two th by uh, Arthur Clarke. And um, I just decided, well, I'm out here. Um, who are they going to find to play my role? So um, I, I actually just called MGM. I didn't call my agent. I called MGM and asked to speak to the director, explaining who I was. And he got on, uh, Helm, uh, what was his name? Um, hmm? Peter Himes. Peter thank you, yes. And um, so I said, Peter, um, I know it's been a lot of years, and it was, this is 19, about 1983, so that many years after 66. Uh, um, and I said, Peter, uh, you might be surprised. I, I haven't aged as much as you think I might have. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mom and Dad, for those genes. And uh, so I think uh, you should meet me. So he invited me to the commissary. We had lunch together. And um, I, I came back to my hotel. And there was a message from my agent saying you you got the, the offer to do the Did role. you shoot at MGM in California? I'm trying to remember that we did it at MGM. Yeah, it was shot in California. Yeah. The whole film was shot in California. So then it, you didn't go back and to London. And a wonderful cast, eh? Helen Mirren and... Uh, yeah, I what? saw the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but I thought it was about Roy Scheider hustling some English broad. <laughs> I did like the last shot, the two sons. I thought that was marvelous, but I didn't care for it. Over here. Hello, gentlemen. Hi. Hi. Um, I think one of the really great things about 2001 is that it's an oddly prescient film in that it almost sort of became a self-fulfilling prophecy and kind of enhanced future design and technology. 
Um, have you ever experienced a feeling of deja vu just kind of going about your daily lives? Like, do you just see, do you notice subtle things like, oh, we did that back in 68, back on set? Well, you know, the first time I sat in an airplane and saw a screen, a television screen in the back of the seat in front of me, kind of brought it back. I said, my God, Stan, he, so many things that he predicted have come around, have come about. The iPad. I mean, yeah. sc- the iPad, Skyping. I mean, the whole, it, it is amazing. Uh, hibernation, which is, they've, they've approached hibernation in, in hospitals for certain kinds of operations. I mean, it's amazing what he, yeah, it is like deja vu. You're right. <laughs> Over here? Yeah. Um, did Stanley ever tell you what the ending means? <laughs> you want to take a shot at him? <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> you know, the, uh, uh, you know, when I don't know if you've ever been crazy. If they ever ran a Rorschach test past you, you know, they drop ink down and they say, okay, see this ink spot? What do you make out of it? And you go, well, I see a, der- I see a tank and a, a deer hunter, you know. Well, <clears throat> 2001, to me, is kind of just, you know, the regeneration of life on Earth after it's been gone through a process. I mean, that's how I look at that. When, when, in fact, that baby even looked like you a little bit. It had sort of, <laughs> no, it had, it had features that resembled Curatad, maybe from a caricature point of view. And so I, I looked at the ending, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm right or whatever, but I just, I said, aha, yeah, it's the, you know, the return of the man-child, you know? He's going to go to Earth, and it'll be a change. Now... I can tell you this, that after 2001 came out, there was a definite sociological change in the world. I did the pilot for Star Trek. And I remember between Star Trek... Well, when I did it, I I was kind of embarrassed by it. <laughs> I... I I said to Roddenberry, I, I, I get silver eyes? He said, yeah. I, I'll tell a joke on myself. He said, I said, well, what happens? He said, well, you get zapped and you become God. And I said, uh, I got that. And he said, well, we all know that's who you think you are, so you can, <laughs> you can play God. But I, I, I enjoyed signing autographs after, but it, it was the worst job I ever had because of the silver eyes I had. It was terrible. Um. It's, it's, it's interesting. I think, uh, you know, Stanley was never tempted to kind of tie a convenient knot at the end of a no. story. I mean, it really is the, the ending. Can, I've had, I, I remember a nun saying it was one of the most religious experiences was, she ever had. I was I, with you. Yeah. We were standing outside in the foyer, and Gene Hackman and Warren Beatty came up, and Beatty said, you guys are lucky. You remember that? Yeah, yeah. And Hackman just kind of growled at us. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, so, and then I've had non-believers come and say it was one of the most profound experiences they've ever had. So it, it is open uh, to so many interpretations. For me, it's, as Gary said, it's a metaphor for evolution. Um, and it's, if any, it's a metaphor for change. The only thing that you can predict about anything in life is change. Change will happen. 100% chance of change. And in, in a sense, you know, without being overly simple, uh, there's a lot of that philosophy in, in, in the film. And, and literally, I mean, obviously, the human beings, the, 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 the primitive man and the modern man, Gary and I, and, and then the fetus, somehow uh, show it's the evolutionary Darwinistic link for for evolution and that in the power of these in, 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 of the of the aliens that were 400 million years what no 4 million years in the future um, they they created a transformation if literally what the that strange room this is my interpretation it's not what stanley told me but my interpretation of that strange louis the 16th room is that these so advanced uh, aliens could read my mind like a tape recorder. And maybe one day I was visiting Paris and walked through the Louvre and saw a 16th century room. Well, what did that mean to the aliens? Habitat. 
You know how we take a polar bear and we put them in a zoo, and we build a, we put, we, we build a, a cave and put an artificial pool for the. For, well, they were doing that, only it was all internal in some way. While I was being transformed and aging, and finally going to death and being rebirth, re reborn. I'd like to just add one comment about that. I think that one of the big dilemmas that faces the average man, particularly if it becomes a mass of people like the French or the Chinese or, you know, or ISIS or whatever the hell it is, is that people fall under the traps of believing certain philosophies or believing like a certain strata of thought processes. It's very hard to look at the earth and, and it's out here you know in the solar system and it took years for copernicus discovered and then you know then the, what you would call it was jailed and then he ground a lens and proved we were in a solar system and it's hard to believe that the earth's been here for billions of years and so the whole evolutionary process is so slow and people they want to they want to wrap it up if you look at 2001 the, as, as kira mentioned there's no wrapping up I mean, unless Stanley wrapped it up and never told anybody, and he's dead now, so we can't really know. But, you know, Kier's, I say, the caricature of Kier in the baby had certain eyes, which were Kier-like eyes. And he just turns, and he kind of turns toward the earth, and then it's over. And it's, it's up to you. So you go home and say, Okay, this is what I thought. And, 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 and your thoughts will be based on your personal book. And you can't ask for anything more. Well said, well said Gary. He's over here. Uh, Kier, I think you've aged much better in real life than you did in the film. <laughs> uh, Kubrick was a legendary perfectionist and would do scene after scene after scene. I'd be curious to know, what scene did you do the most takes in? The most takes? I don't really recall. I know. Oh, oh. oh yeah. <laughs> I don't like to do a lot of takes. And Stanley knew that. But we did 35 takes of the space pod. Oh, yeah. Did we? Well, we locked the door and we say, Oh, yes. That's what do true. you think? And the original line that I had, do I had done something with Stanley was, Originally, I'd said, you didn't know this, but I, he said, what do you think? And I looked at Dave and I said, well, Dave, frankly, I don't give a damn. <laughs> and Stan, Stanley, <laughs> oh no, that's a true story. And Stanley looked at me and he said, that's a very clever lock, but I don't think we're going to use that. We can't have our audience's mind flipping to Gone with the Wind <laughs> when we're just about two points off Jupiter, for Christ's sake. Actually, that scene when, he's, when Hal's reading our lips uh, it was much longer in the script, and Stanley felt it was too long. So what he had us do, since it was such uh, downtime between takes sometimes, between, I'm sorry, between setups, because it would take so long to light, depending on the scene, that he would have us go into his office and we would improvise on it. And he tape recorded our improvisations. He had a secretary type up the recordings. We'd come another time and we'd have a new script that was a little shorter and we'd improvise on that until it got as short as you saw it in the film. So it's about, I think, what, damn near a full 1,000 foot load. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And we did 35 takes of it. And I never honestly could figure out the difference between take 17 and take 35. But I think Stanley is famous for, at some point, maybe he just said, yeah, the whole world is sick, uh, feels that I need to make 50 takes. This is the day I punish the guys. You might be interested. Actually, the one that stays in my mind was the one where there was only one take. And that's the shot where um, uh, I, ex I uh, using explosive bolts, uh, enter the emergency hatch. How was that done? Because it looks like I'm weightless, right? It was built upside down that way. So the, 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 the pod, the front of the pod was up there and the camera's down here, right? And they had a wire that was, uh, I was attached to a wire which was out of sight because uh, my body would be between the, the lens and the wire. And uh, the wire was woven into a piece of rope uh, and a, a, circus, a circus roustabout had measured the drop 
80 feet, I don't remember how many feet, it was a long way, a few stories, and, or it seemed like two stories. And um, it, it was woven into the end of the wire that was attached to me, and then he tied a huge knot. Then he measured the same distance again and tied another knot. So if you can imagine, there's the front of the pod, and off to the side, out of camera sight, is a platform. I'm on the platform alongside a circus, the circus roustabout, who has these huge gloves. On action, I dove headfirst, free fall, toward, why, um, by the way, why didn't they use a stunt, be, a stunt man? Because I've forgotten my helmet. So I go few, free fall toward the lens down here, and uh, the roustabout up there is waiting for that big knot to reach his very gloved hands. When it reaches his hands, he jumps off the platform, hurtles to the ground, I go hurtling back up to the ceiling, and then he's waiting for the second knot, and again, he lets go, and I go hurtling back. So that's how I got that kind of bouncing back and forth, as you saw. May I add a comment to that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> he told me about it, and so th I'm watching the movie, I mean, be the 20th time once one day, and at, at the end of it, <clears throat> he does the, the decompression process starts or something, you know, to decompressing the airlock. And I remember when Kier comes down and then he bounces back, there's a moment where he's up there, and I swear to God, if you ever see the movie again, there's a little smile comes over your face. Do you remember? <laughs> because, like, like <laughs> holy Christ, I'm over. alive. <laughs> It's not, it's, not a, it's not an out of character thing, or just this moment of, he, he couldn't help himself. Oh my, I'm alive, man. <laughs> I, I, can I tell you one funny shot that I'm Sure, sure, go yeah. ahead. He's involved as well. He comes in, he climbs down the hub, and then he starts walking on the bottom. And he walks up to me, and I'm sitting there with my iPad. All and in I'm, one shot, yeah, no cutaway. Yeah, no cutaway. Well, <laughs> they they harness me upside down. I'm the cowboy stunt man, so I I'm, I'm you know he's got me in a harness, and, and he takes me up to the top of the wheel. And there's three pieces of food in front of me, red, yellow, green, or whatever the hell they are. And uh, Stanley was the coolest guy going. He said, "All right, Lockwood, on action, uh, just start eating." <laughs> And so I'm upside down trying to be cool. Like, <laughs> you know, and I take the fork and I go like this. Well, I'm left-handed and I take the fork and I go like this. And I pull the food to my mouth and it goes like this. <laughs> that, I, remember, I remember, I'm upside down, I remember looking down, if you will, like doing that. And it goes... And then at that moment, it looked like a shot out of The Shining, you know, because it was like that blood splattering, you know. And that's the end of that entire day's work. <laughs> so what they did, when I entered that and came down the ladder and then walked up to him, of course, they, that centrifuge actually did revolve. It was built by Vickers Aircraft and was built uh, the equivalent uh, today's money of about $5 million. And... Um, they revolved Gary down to me, and all I had to do was stand in place like this. <laughs> yeah, and he gets all the credit for walking up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid we only have time. Is there one more over here? Where? Yeah, with the mic. Oh. Hi. Um, so my question is, the shots are beautifully composed, and they use a lot of elements of design. Um, was Kubrick very finicky about getting those shots? Like, did he make remake you do it to get the right composition and layout for the shots or was he more like how meticulous was he in getting like everything perfect? I have a definite answer right. that's the reason Kubrick lived in Europe I had worked on Spartacus and it, and I remembered very briefly uh, I had worked in Las Vegas and flown in to Spartacus when he was up in the mountains you know Spartacus and I had I was a stunt man in those days and I had flown in and then gone to Death Valley and you know and it would be an arduous day and then we'd fly back to Vegas to sleep and so later on because I had been up in wherever in the hell it was in Nevada I got a call to go to Universal when uh, the guy who produced the movie was a famous actor. Uh, with Kirk the, Douglas. Kirk Douglas. And Kirk Douglas played Spartacus. And so 
he didn't like that director Daniel Mann or something. They had a hassle, and and so he just he got rid of him. He got Stanley. And Stanley once said to me that it was a great time for him because he'd made two real big art films and, you know, it was a bolt of money and uh, a big picture and it launched him into another uh, stratosphere for his career. Well, I go to work having known who Stanley Kubrick is. And I'm there at the Warrior School and uh, there's a great big black guy Woody Strode, who'd also play, I had played football at UCLA. Woody had played years before. I knew him. I'm chatting with him. And uh, he says, this guy Kubrick's really something. I said, I know who he is. I, I'm a fan of Kubrick since I've been 15 years old. And I said, it's kind of fun just to be here. Well, later Stanley told me that <clears throat> he'd set a shot, see, on, on Spartacus in the warrior school. He'd set a shot, and then he'd go off and sit down, and they'd light. Then he'd come back and he'd look in camera and the shot had been rearranged. And the cameraman was a big, uh, I think, Academy Award winner named Russell Matty. And he and Stanley began to have a hassle. Now, Stanley is the brightest guy that ever picked up a viewfinder. He's more knowledgeable in, in, in making films than anybody that ever did it, period. I mean, you have to just trust me on that. And... Uh, you know, aspect ratios are burned into his pituitary. And he comes back and he, you know, went to Douglas and said, Kirk, I really enjoy the opportunity to make this wonderful big movie. But I have to tell you something. We got to move to Spain. And he never went back to America to make a movie. Do you want me to do that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Before, before we go, um, there was a scene cut yeah. from the film. There was a scene cut where I speak to Mission Control, and Stanley uh, cut it out of the film later because he felt it was too redundant with another several conversations with Mission Control. But it was a scene I was worrying about a lot because it was technological gobbledygook for me. It was very hard to memorize. It was just it was like memorizing a foreign language. So I, was, I worked on this speech for over and over for weeks in advance. I mean, let's, let's, let's face it, I d didn't have a big line load. None of, none of us did. There's very little dialogue in this film. But this is a speech that was very hard to memorize. This is 1961, and it is engraved in my mind. I will go to my grave with it. And this 65. is how it went. Hmm? 65. 65 what? 1965. When you what did I say? 61. Oh, all right. Did you not? No. See, I'm losing my mind already. But anyway, 66. 66, yes. And it went like this. Mission Control is his X-ray Delta 1. At 19020 onboard fault prediction center, and our 9000 computer showed Alpha Echo 35 unit as possible failure within 48 hours. Request check your in-ship systems simulator. Also confirm your approval. Our plan to go EVA and replace Alpha Echo 35 unit prior to failure. Mission Control, this is X-Ray Delta 1. Transmission concluded. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. <laughs> I don't have Alzheimer, right? <laughs> so I'm going to remind you, uh, stay in your seats while we get uh, Kier and Gary down to the signing. And once again, guys, thank you so much for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, Our the legends, Kier DeLay, Gary Lockwood. Great audience. Thank you.